Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for being here this uh, this afternoon. This is a stormy afternoon in Madrid. In fact, we are going to uh, to show you uh, what the EULA COVID-19 database is and uh, what is its space within the Global Rheumat uh, Rheumatology Alliance. And we have uh, all the people here to answer all your, all your questions. We are going to have very short presentations of uh, uh, all these uh, members and uh, we also have a special uh, presentation by a rheumatology resident. So I uh, will keep this uh, very short so that uh, we have the information that we actually are interested in. So uh, Diego, whenever you want, you can you can show us your site. Thank you, Loreto. I'm going to share my screen at this moment. Can you hear me right? Yes. OK. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Loreto, for this opportunity of sharing my experience as a last year rheumatology resident during this COVID-19 pandemic. This was me at the beginning of March on a preparatory course on how to properly use a personal protective equipment. At this point, I could not foresee what was coming in the following weeks, and I don't think any of us could imagine that a virus we didn't even know so much before would change or works and lies forever. I will briefly summarize some facts and feelings of these last two months and how I live it in Hospital La Paz in Madrid. As I was saying, uh, at the, uh, it all started in Spain, I would say, at the end of February and beginning of uh, March, and the main message here was to stay calm and especially not to worry. Actually, on TV, there was a lot of messages saying that there was a bit too much of a coronanoia and too much of a worry regarding the virus. However, the situation in the hospital was a little bit different because we have a strong infectious disease system and they were already warning of the importance of the virus and the impact it will have. I remember I had a, a night shift at the end of February with an infectious disease doctor and at that time, he told me that even if we were sure of the outcome at an individual level, the impact for the population will be definitely very important. And we started uh, to feel that more uh, the following week. Can we go to the next slide, Loreto? We started to feel that more uh, the following week uh, when, we rega uh, when we kept an eye on Italy and we saw how they were really struggling to contain the transmission of the, of the pandemic. At this point, we didn't have many cases in Spain, but we uh, were aware of the importance of isolating the cases. And with this intent, the hospital developed guidelines on how to isolate in the patients, especially in the emergency department. Also, some parts of the hospital had to be restructured. For example, the physical rehabilitation gym was converted into a COVID-19 ward. But we, didn't, we weren't fully aware of the situation until the following week that we can see in the next slide. And uh, here we realized that this was an unprecedented situation for us. As you can see, we multiplied the number of hospitalization by 10 and we multiplied the number of patients in Spain by 15 times. We started to have patients with very low blood oxygen saturation and uh, we, struggled, we really struggled to uh, treat these patients. And the real problem was that even if everything was new, we had new teams, new workflow, the intensive care units couldn't adapt as fast as we were doing in the rest of the hospital. So we had to get, get used to have patients with 85, 90% blood oxygen saturation and have them in our own wards. And we didn't feel really prepared for this. And also we, have an important, we had an important lack of material. And this make us, made us wonder a lot of things. Are, are we having good protection? Are we doing the best for our patients? Uh, is there anything else we could do to save lives? And all of this make us feel really frustrated. This lack of material, these poor outcomes we were getting made this week, one of the most difficult of the pandemic. But like we're learning from our own experience and we could see in the following times, in the next slide, the number, uh, even if the number of cases were still very high in our hospital and we have reached the peak of the pandemic in Spain, we felt much more prepared. I was actually really impressed by how the hospital was managing the situation. They were developing protocols every other day 
for us to to uh, to manage the situation better. For example, here you can see a protocol on thromboprophylaxis or another protocol on difficult decision making regarding ethical situation. And I think we felt really supported by that. The situation was still really difficult, but we have learned from experience and that was really important for us. And we continued and in the next slide, we can see how even if we continue having a lot of cases, we established an impressive ambience of collaboration. We felt inspired by each other in a way I had never seen in the hospital. In my team here, you have an orthopedic surgeon, a neurologist, an internal medicine doctor, a rheumatologist, and we were all collaborating in an incredible manner. I remember just three weeks after we started, the orthopedic surgeon was discussing with me about tocilizumab, about lymphopenia, and I was amazed by how much he had learned in barely two weeks. And uh, not only inside the hospital, but also outside the hospital, people uh, weren't clapping every night at 8 p.m. for cheering us up. Restaurants were making donations. Whenever we call the patient, they even encourage us to keep doing our work. Uh, I definitely gained purpose as a doctor. As a strange as it may sound, I felt lucky to be working during these terrible times. And as you can see in the last slide, uh, if I learned anything during these uh, two months, is that we can always see light among darkness. And uh, that's the thing I think we, we cannot afford to lose, the hope. As a very great doctor once told me, we are not alone, and the way to get through this is to stand together. Thank you very much, and take care, everything. Okay, so now Pedro Machado will explain the objectives and the launch of the COVID-19 Eula database. Thank you, Loreto. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Good. Can I have the first slide, please? Okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, there, there, there was this potential premise that, um, you know, people with rheumatic diseases uh, may be at an increased risk of a serious uh, COVID-19 infection. But this, this is just this was just an assumption because we in reality uh, nobody was sure about anything, and the, and the and the differential risk according to the disease. And now the reasons for this is because they are often immunosuppressed or at least taking immunomodulatory drugs, and they can also express high levels of comorbidity. For example, interstitial lung disease in patients with antisynthetase syndrome or uh, systemic sclerosis, et cetera, et cetera. Moreover, many of these patients um, uh, are taking drugs that then became of interest in the, con in the context of COVID-19. So it became even more important to understand the outcome, not only of patients with rheumatic diseases, but the patients taking all these medications that in some cases were being tested as medications to prevent COVID-19 or to prevent a worse outcome of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, and because, so we have, we have limited data about the specific risks in patients with rheumatic diseases or in those receiving in, immunosuppression. And, and all this absence of data highlighted the uncertainty that is faced uh, is highlighted by the uncertainty faced by national societies or international societies when, when de developing guidelines. Most of the recommendations that have been uh, proposed by national and international organizations uh, completely lack evidence, an evidence base. They are based on expert opinion uh, because there, there was no information, there was no evidence uh, about these topics. Uh, on the other hand, many of the existing European registrars, registries would not be able, at least in an in a, in a adequate time frame, uh, to present this evidence uh, because they are not designed to capture this information in a rapid way and they're not uh, designed in a way that we're able to analyze this information in a timely fashion. And this um, kind of highlighted the need for a global approach, a method that would facilitate the collection of a large number of cases over a short period of time. 
And this uh, led to the creation of the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance. Uh, this was started by a, a group of uh, rheumatologists uh, from uh, various places in, in the world, Europe, Australia, US. The, one of the key persons is actually based in Australia. And, and, and this group established a, an international collaboration that includes not only rheumatologists, but uh, scientists and also, and also patients. And they define the mission as the, um, uh, the ability to collect, analyze and disseminate information about COVID-19 and rheumatology to patients, to physicians, and all relevant stakeholders in order to improve the care of patients with, with rheumatic disease. Next slide, please. Now, initially, uh, this group, uh, they envis envisioned the, the database as a single data, data entry point. Uh, and so they created um, a RedCap database that's, that is uh, um, hosted by uh, a university in the in US, University of California, San Francisco. But then uh, they quickly realized that with uh, all the legal issues in, in Europe and the concerns about GDPR, it might not be possible or at least feasible in a, in a timely fashion to have uh, groups and rheumatologists from Europe uploading data to a database that is hosted by a U.S. university. And that's when EULA, they very, very quickly decided that, uh, you know, that it was in the interest of the global rheumatology community and the in, in the interest of our patients to establish a, a partnership with the Global Rheumatology Alliance. And, uh, and we, uh, we, we, we created a database that is, in fact, hosted by the University of Manchester that mirrors the database that uh, had been created by the Global Rheumatology Alliance. And that was the initial step, this, uh, this, this partnership was the initial step uh, that led to the development of the EULAR COVID-19 database. Next slide, please. And here you can see the, the, the websites uh, of, uh, of, both, uh, of both the EULAR and the Global Rheumatology Alliance. And using the EULAR uh, database, so that this is for, patient, for uh, uh, rheumatologists, healthcare providers that are working either in EULAR countries or European countries in, in general, because uh, as you know, some EULAR countries are not, are not in Europe, like, like Israel. Uh, and on the right hand side, you have the Global Rheumatology Alliance webpage. And, and, and if you're from a country that, from your, if you're from a European country, if you, if you go to the Global, Global Rheumatology Alliance webpage, it will direct you to the EULAR uh, webpage and vice versa. If you're not from a EULAR country or from Europe, the EULAR webpage will direct you to the COVID-19 uh, Global Rheumatology Alliance webpage. And the, the reason for this is to avoid duplication of cases. This way we can be sure that there is no duplication of cases and that when we analyze the data, we, 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 we make sure that we are analyzing individual, individual cases. Thank you, Loreto. And this was my introduction. I'll take over now. Um, so, so I'm going to tell you, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to tell you a bit more about how the COVID-19 ULAR database is managed. So as uh, Pedro mentioned, we made a relatively rapid decision to base the database uh, at the University of Manchester. And a lot of these decisions that we made over what was in essence uh, less than one week were quite pragmatic and based on where we had uh, staff available that could uh, do these roles. The first thing we did, however, was before we wanted to go ahead and collect data uh, from our patients, we needed to assess whether we would need any special permissions and in particular whether we needed ethical approval. So we knew that this database had been reviewed at the UCSF uh, uh, Ethics Review Board and they had deemed it as non-human research, more under the banner of quality improvement or service evaluation. 
We subsequently took it through the Health Research Authority um, system in the UK, and we actually came to the same decision that this would fall not as health research and therefore no ethical approval was needed. And similarly, no patient consent uh, would be required. And the key factors here was the fact that this was non-interventional and no patient identifiable data would be captured, which I'll come on to. Um, I do need to say that uh, the requirements for ethics do differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And although these uh, two statements are true for the United Kingdom and the USA, we would of course uh, advise people just to double check if they have any uncertainty. Although in most cases where this has been reviewed, this has been the decision. Regarding GDPR, uh, a decision was made that we would capture no identifiable data regarding patients. Therefore, this becomes anonymized data and it becomes outside of GDPR. And this was reviewed by uh, lawyers in a number of countries, both with ULAR and Manchester. We do capture the name and location of the reporter, and there's a few reasons for this. And uh, as this is you reporting your own information, it falls under a privacy notice. Uh, I'll come on to this in a few minutes, but we are sharing data with UCF. Importantly, uh, at this point, all identifiable data, including any data from the reporters, is stripped out as well. In terms of oversight, this fell under the ULAR Standing Committee for Epidemiology and Health Services Research, and Pedro was our current chair. Uh, the committee was expanded to include Laura Gossick, uh, who is the past chair, myself, Loretto Carmona, Anja Strangfeld in Berlin, and uh, we also have included Elsa Matus, who is our patient representative from uh, PARE. We are involved in a wider standing uh, global steering committee, and Pedro is the ULAR representative on that. So how do you report? Were you, uh, Pedro has already shown you the ULAR CV19 database homepage, and in a few minutes our database manager will take you through this in more detail. But the access is uh, through the ULAR website, and it clearly directs you, and as Pedro has already said, it will direct you to other linked databases, such as the global database as appropriate. The next two points I want to make are probably the most critical in terms of what you would report. First of all, we are interested in any case of COVID-19 infection in a patient with a pre-existing rheumatic disease. We know that many jurisdictions are not undertaking community testing, so if you have a very high suspicion, even though this isn't confirmed, we would encourage you also to report these cases. And there is a focus on inflammatory diseases. So for instance, we would not expect cases being reported in patients who have only osteoarthritis or only fibromyalgia. And most critically, it's important that the cases are not reported into the database until the outcome is known. Either the patient has died or they have survived the infection. This is because the data are anonymized and we really find it difficult to be able to go back and update the outcomes on these patients. As we know that outcomes can be uh, delayed in patients with COVID uh, infection, we would suggest you wait uh, at least seven days, if not 14 days. The data being captured uh, are fairly straightforward things that are easily identifiable from the most uh, recent patient letter in your uh, patient record, as well as any laboratory tests that may be available. We appreciate that some rheumatologists may not have access to this, and therefore the facilities to indicate where you don't know some of these uh, is easily identifiable. And we're capturing details around the diagnosis and treatment for the rheumatology condition, as well as information around the COVID uh, infection itself. As uh, Pedro alluded to, the REDCap database, which originally developed at UCSF, and we've been working extremely collaboratively, and we have launched a parallel database using the exact same data programming uh, within the ULAR database. So therefore, it is very easy to merge these data sets, which is the plan for when we undertake uh, analyses more generally of the database. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, Loretto, could you um, make it forward? I'm going to inform you how we collaborate with the national societies. Thank you. <laughs>
Within the EULA um, database, we invited all rheumatologists in EULA countries, as you heard already, to report COVID-19 cases. In some countries, however, they are national nationwide COVID-19 databases. And this is the case, for example, in France, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and in Germany. It would be a great pity to not use this data and the efforts already made from the rheumatologists and um, therefore we asked the database holders, which are in most cases the national societies, to include the nationally collected data in the EULA database. This is also, again, to avoid um, doublets of the cases. Also, it gives us the chance to do comparison between different countries and healthcare systems, and which is even more important, we, have, we now can gather enough cases to perform complex analysis for the much needed research questions where we really need very robust results. Um, next, please. <laughs> so what are the requirements for adding data of national databases? First of all, a prerequisite for the inclusion is that the um, harmonization of data collected took place. That means that parameters collected in the national databases have to be at least to a certain extent the same as those collected in the EULA database. The second is that the technical requirements for data transfer have to be met. The EULA database is based on a REDCap web application, as you already heard, and the export of the um, nationally collected data has to be possible. Aggregated data sets would not be of value for the aims of the EULA and also the global COVID-19 database. And that means that the export of data from the national databases must be on base of individual patient data sets and it has to be anonymized. As you also already heard, is that we have to um, rely on completed cases. And that means completed cases in the sense that they are fully monitored. That means um, cases that are transferred to the EULA database should have at least the outcome of COVID-19 and as well as the rheumatological diagnose and the treatment. Next, please. When all the technical requirements are fulfilled, then it comes to the contract issues that are quite easy and the collaboration contracts are set between the EULA and the national societies that hold the database. The national leads should at least at that time also prove if additional votes of their ethics committees are required and if the consent forms from the patients allow sharing of anonymized individual data. Next, please. As an example, I briefly want to explain the collaboration with the Italian database. They have a nationwide COVID-19 database since March 2020 and contacted the EULA in April um, to share their data and to avoid the double entries. Very fast, the harmonization of the parameters um, was performed within their database with variables collected in the EULA database and also the technical requirements were examined and also tested and we found out as a result that the transfer was very easily possible. Then the contract was set with the National Society of Italy and since then the website of the EULA COVID-19 database has a hyperlink referring to the Italian database. How, how does it function? If an Italian rheumatologist wants to report a case, then he is um, requested not to enter the case in the EULA database, but, um, but instead through the national database system of Italy. And in the lower right corner, you see how this hyperlink um, looks like at the website. And meanwhile, there are also other hyperlinks um, for example, also to the German register and database. Since this hyperlink is active, the Italian database um, exports data on a weekly base. 
Next, please. So this is how the data flow is going. Um, next, please. Um, yes, data from the national databases A, B, C and D run in specific countries are exported to the EULA database. And in addition with the other data sets from the non-EULA countries and um, uh, non uh, the other databases in addition, also in addition the EULA database also gets direct entries from countries that don't have national databases. And with the data from the EULA database and um, the, the global database from non-EULA countries, those data are merged together and then they are analyzed in collaboration within the Global Rheumatology Alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So I'm just going to show you how straightforward it is to actually enter a case into the ULA database. So starting point is just the main ULA website. On the front page, there will be a link which says report a COVID-19 case. And once you've clicked this link, it will take you to the page which you've previously seen. So here in big, bold writing under the image, you can see is click here in red. And this is where you click to go to the database and report a case of COVID-19. Before we look at the actual database, I'd just like to highlight a couple of other things on that page. So at the top right, we have links to the latest reports from the database, and these are updated weekly. And in the other screenshot, this shows links to documents and screenshots we've prepared, which give you information on the questions you'll be asked in the database. I'd like to encourage you, especially if you haven't submitted a case before, to look at these. The database is not set up for you to save and return, and as previously mentioned, it's difficult for us to go back in and change data once submitted. So once you've clicked on the link, this is the first page you will see. And as Anya just mentioned, we are collaborating with several national societies and links to their respective databases are here, for example, Italy and Portugal. As Kimmy already mentioned, please only report a case when you know the outcome. So that is the patient is either died or the case is resolved. And once you've had a read through all this and you're happy, then you just click this tick button at the bottom of the page to proceed. You'll be then asked to enter provider information. So this is your information, the details of the person reporting the case. Any fields which have must provide value in red are compulsory. So that's things like your first and last name, your email, the hospital and city you work in and the country you are from. If your country does not appear in this list it is because you are part of the global registry or you are one of the national societies we are collaborating with and you need to go to one of those databases to input your data. Once you've entered everything on this page, then again, you just click this tick to carry on. So you'll then be taken to here and asked to enter any clinical case details. And again, any must provide value fields are compulsory. We've made it as simple as possible for you and made sure that as many questions as possible are tick boxes. There are options for unknown. And for example, if the patient has displayed symptoms of COVID that aren't in the list provided. We do have another option where you can further explain the symptoms they had. The outcome question, probably our most important. Um, so there's two main options and then additional questions will be displayed if you click on them. So on the left, you can see if you click the patient's recovered, you'll be asked things like approximate number of days from symptom onset to resolution. And on the right, if the patient has died, you'll be asked to confirm that they have died. And then again, the number of days from onset to death. And if the patient is deceased not due to COVID, then we do ask for you to give us the other cause of death. There are many other questions, as Kimmy mentioned, um, mainly around COVID treatment and rheumatic diagnosis and treatment. Once you've enter as much information as possible. And again, we do have our own options. You'll reach the bottom of the page. Here we have two text boxes. The first one is an opportunity for you to provide any other extra case notes that you think are appropriate. And I just like stress, do not write any patient identifiable information in this box. Below that, there's another text box where you can provide comments or feedback on the database and survey itself. 
Um, if you think anything needs to be changed or altered, please let us know. We do look at these and take them into consideration when making future changes. At the very bottom of the page just here is the link to the privacy notice, which will tell you how we handle the provider details you entered. And once you're happy with all of that, you click that same tick button again, and this submits your data to the ULAR database. Once you've submitted your data, you'll be shown this page, and please make a note of this patient identifier here in red. If for any reason we need to query some data you've submitted, we will use this identifier when emailing you. So once you've made a note of this, you click the tick at the bottom to exit the page, and that's it, you're done. You've entered the case into the ULAR database. So hello everyone, Norgo Sek from Paris, also part of this uh, team, and we're going to look now at uh, some preliminary results up to today of, uh, of this, uh, the results of this database. So can you please uh, go to the next one, Loretto? Okay, so just to reiterate, you know, that of course, we're looking, going to report here only the key characteristics of the patients. We do have plans for more detailed analyses. Um, and uh, with rapid publication. And uh, for now, what I'm going to show you is basically just the, uh, the, the main results of the database. Move to the next one, please, or should I take over? No. So this is a total number of page, pa patients. Currently, as of a few days ago, we had more th than 600 patients in the ULAR COVID uh, database. What's quite interesting is that that number of patients is very similar to the number in the um, GRA database. So uh, in the rest of the GRA database, if you want. So basically Europe is representing half of the worldwide cases, if you want. Also, currently we are not yet including all the data from Europe. And that's been discussed before, um, working with national societies. France has around 600 uh, more patients who will be joining the ULAR COVID database with, by mid-June. And Germany has uh, more than 200 patients, and those patients should also at some point be included, but they're not on this one. We can see clearly that the number is still increasing, even though there is, of course, less of an upward uh, curve as the number of cases is uh, getting a bit smaller in Europe, uh, thankfully. Next one, please. So these are the countries who are um, giving us the most cases or have given us the most cases. Uh, number one is the UK. Yeah, yay, yay, yay for the UK. And then you can see um, Spain and uh, Italy. Sorry, I put that in the wrong way around, but it's Italy first and then Spain. Uh, and you see the numbers here. So well done to all of you from those countries. You see that the other countries have uh, um, given less cases for now, again, taking into account that uh, Germany and France are not yet fully included in, the, in this data set. We really feel we're very thankful that so many collaborators are um, entering data into this uh, collaborative data set. Next one. Some description of the patients up to, up to now. So um, this is the type of report that we're also sending out and you may have received. Um, we're sending that very regularly. So currently the main diagnosis, as you can see here, either on the bottom of the right or the left part, bottom left or right part of the slide, are um, RA um, and then uh, psoriatic arthritis. I think uh, quite strangely so, but there you go. <laughs> and not such a frequent disease. Actual spondylar arthritis, um, 10%, and then lupus, 8%, and gout, 5%. So that's, um, I think, quite interesting. Of course, we cannot say that it reflects the distribution of these diseases among patients who have COVID. What it does reflect is the distribution of patients who have been entered into our database. So, of course, we don't have a denominator if you want. This isn't in any way um, systematic. It's ent entirely based on people reporting cases. So I'm not surprised that RA comes out as number one, but we could maybe discuss in the QANA the distribution across the other diseases. Of course, patient demographics are also not the same in these different diseases and comorbidities and co-medications uh, neither. On the top, you can see that we have for now 64% females, 
Um, very few children, only um, five uh, less than 18 years old reported. And then we have um, about half of the patients who are between 18 and 64 and 42% who are above 65. So um, again, you know, uh, this is just descriptive, but I think it's interesting. The comorbidities are on the bottom right side here, and you can see that a fourth of the patients have no comorbidities, and then um, the main one reported is uh, lung disease, uh, 23%, and then you have um, also hypertension is even more frequent than that, so hypertension number one and lung disease number two, two among the comorbidities. Next one, please. Again, with all the limitations of such, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, types of data collection, it, it is interesting to look at the treatments. And so 60% are, so 80% are, are on any disease modifying drug and then conventional drugs, 60%, biologics, 30%, targeted synthetic drugs, only 3%. Um, it would be interesting to know how this reflects, of course, these disease groups we have not analyzed with great detail or which diseases are getting which drugs. And I cannot at this point give you any link around causality or any type of association between the drugs and the uh, COVID disease or its outcomes. Um, next one. And now for the COVID disease itself, we are collecting the main symptoms. Um, as reported by the patients or in the medical files. And of course, um, fever and cough are the first ones there, around three quarters of patients. Shortness of breath, quite frequent, half of our population here. Um, it is also uh, possible that some patients were asymptomatic because you can describe a case even if the patient has no symptoms. If a patient has been in contact with someone and has had a PCR, you can perfectly report that patient if the patient is positive, even without symptoms. Next slide, please. And now the outcomes, which we are presenting again with uh, great caution because of all the bias and selection and reporting bias, if you want, which is that of our cases currently, 62% um, have necessitated hospitalization and um, there are today 102 deaths among these cases. With all the limitations, um, I don't think we, well, we, we can discuss this more at the discussion point. And I think that's the last uh, one, yeah, just to say, um, and thank you, Kimi, for preparing this slide. But basically, um, you know, this is really interesting to have this information. And I think we can be very proud that uh, within ULAR, we have managed to collect more than 600 patients to date. Um, and it gives us some information, quite raw data, of course, on the diagnosis, on the treatments, and on the outcomes. But we have to be very careful. We don't really have a denominator. We within our um, steering group believe that uh, there is certainly a reporting bias and that the more severe cases will be reported more. Also because patients who have very mild symptoms may not even have contacted their doctor. We have not seen all the patients. Everyone is basically staying home and uh, we may not have the information specifically on patients who have not too severe cases. So. We have to be very careful about not drawing links, but it is, of course, very interesting to see the descriptive information. And I believe that's it for me. I think it's the last slide. And now we'll be very happy for to answer any questions. You can ask questions of any one of us. I'll hand it back to Loretto now for the moderation of the questions. We suggest that you use the meeting chat function, which is the little like square box with a little lines in it which you can click on and then you can type in your questions there and uh, we can see them and react to them. Thank you very much, Lo, Saskia, Anja, Kime, Pedro and Diego. Uh, we are ready now to to get, to get any questions from, from you. You can just uh, type, you will see in the middle of your screen uh, a chat button. You just uh, write some message there. 
while you decide what you want to ask. Yes, here we have one question, one that says, of the deaths, was there a significant link between those with comorbidities such as COPD? Who can answer that? Kimi, Anya? I can answer that. Um, hello, Claire, a friend of uh, us in rheumatology in the UK. <laughs> um, I think this is an area of great interest, Claire, because we've seen in the general population reports that the majority of people who have had uh, severe COVID and died it has been linked to comorbidities. Um, Laura very nicely pointed out the limitations uh, such that it makes inference and uh, testing causality somewhat limited. However, there are plans for us to explore uh, at least a very high level of description among the patients who have died. Uh, this is not yet something that we've done. Okay. Um, what about while we wait for other questions, how can we make sure uh, we don't have a duplicate. Uh, I'm, happy to answer, yeah, I'm happy to answer that and Saskia can help me uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, so this was a real concern for us because it is anonymous data and therefore uh, the possibility of duplicates being entered was something we considered very early on. Uh, as Saskia pointed out, there, due to the way the databases are set up, you cannot select your country in the database that you can submit your data to. So therefore, if you start to enter data and you do not find the country of your hospital, you're in the wrong database and you should exit uh, and go back and find the one that's right. And hopefully that's very clearly laid out on both the global and the ULARD web pages. Okay, this is uh, something that is more medical. and I'm not sure if we, if we have that uh, those data. Uh, Elsa asked whether we, there have been any problems incubating patients with cervical fusion involvement and placing them on the front. I don't know whether Diego may have some information about that being up from. I'm not sure if I understand what uh, cervical fusion involvement means. Uh, well, meaning... uh, array. Uh, ah, you mean, uh, ah, yeah, uh, cervical, yeah, cervical. Uh, I have not had experience actually uh, in my hospital. We we didn't have any uh, RA uh, as far as I as I know in the intensive care unit. So I don't I don't have experience in uh, for, to answer this question. Yeah. Uh, no. uh, and uh, and do we Pedro. have that information uh, in the list, Pedro? Yeah. So well, this we won't be able to um, answer this question with uh, with our data set because we don't collect this granular detail. But in general, for example, I think maybe the, the person that asked the question was thinking about patients, for example, with ankylosing spondylitis that may have fused vertebra. And obviously it's known that it's more difficult to intubate the, the, those patients. So that's, mm -hmm. that was already a difficulty in the past. And certainly if those patients end up needing to be intubated, it's, 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 uh, it will be a difficulty as well. Yeah. Yeah, in any case, uh, the complications can be uh, included in as information, but uh, I, I, if you have not seen it, Kimi or Saskia, we still don't have that information. Yeah. Okay, Ben uh, is asking whether it's going to be possible to tease out whether some diagnoses and or treatments are protective against or cause susceptibility, susceptibility to COVID, given the limitations. Maybe I can make a few comments about that. Yeah. So, I don't think it will be prob uh, possible to prove this, um, but but I think it will be possible to generate some hypotheses. So certainly um, there will be possible to uh, look at associations uh, between the outcome of, of COVID and, uh, and certain conditions or certain treatments. Um, and this will certainly generate some hypotheses, but we will not be able to show causality because of the limitations of, of the database. But I'm sure that the, the database will allow us to generate very interesting data and hypotheses. Yeah. The, the next question maybe uh, throws some light because it is asking whether there might be any relation between uh, hydroxychloroquine doses and admission rate and mortality. Not not really admit rate, 
but mortality, I think uh, it might. Uh, are we collecting the doses of uh, hydroxychloroquine? So the database doesn't capture details of the doses, which is a limitation, but it does capture um, whether or not patients continued the medication after they were uh, diagnosed with COVID. It is expected that majority of patients would be receiving standard doses of hydroxychloroquine for their existing disease. Uh, the other thing I want to say to help answer this question is this is a database of people who have developed COVID. We do not have any information in this database on people who have not developed COVID. So therefore, we can only describe uh, the hydroxychloroquine doses that people who have the infection have received. And there may be perhaps the opportunity to compare between those who have had severe courses or have died. Oh, next question says, uh, did uh, you consider to allow patients to self-report? Are there any legal issues on how to check accuracy? So this is not a database for patients to report directly into. This is uh, a database only for physicians to report patients uh, of their own. Uh, and this is one of the reasons we do ask for the provider uh, information such that we can validate that to some degree. I'd like to highlight, however, that under the GRA and under many other organizations, there are parallel uh, studies and databases going on where patients can self-report. And in particular, I think these are quite good in that they're capturing other aspects uh, um, that us as physicians aren't seeing. So they're capturing the worry that patients have, the fear, whether people are adapting their treatments and, you know, have you lost jobs because of this and what the greater impact of COVID in the general rheumatology population. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, the people who's attending might be interested if they are uh, putting uh, cases, uh, entering cases in, in this uh, database. Um, are they going to be shown in the publications, Pedro? Uh, sorry, could you ask the question again? Which? Yes, uh, if uh, if they provide uh, with the uh, cases in the in the database, will they be uh, acknowledged in the publications? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, that's that. No, thank you very much for that question. We are very keen on being inclusive, uh, and uh, and and everyone reporting at least five cases to the database will be included in a uh, in a group of authors uh, called the global uh, rheumatology alliance uh, and so the all these all these people will come in the, an appendix and uh, and basically uh, formally they will be considered authors of of the paper and they will appear on on on, on pubmed um, so we are very keen on recognizing the effort of so many rheumatologists that, you know, in a volunteer way, uh, you know, spending time uploading cases. Uh, so we are, we are, we will do this. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's not only uh, rheumatologists joining. As I, as oh yeah, the, absolutely. Very exactly correct. Yeah. We even have yeah. uh, an ophthalmologist that uploaded cases. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one more question. Uh, what if they have some, uh, if they want to use the, the database for analysis? So we are, uh, uh, there will be that possibility. At the moment, we are still focusing a lot on collecting cases and um, and uh, on, on, on data cleaning. Uh, we are developing uh, a standard, standardized operating procedure so that external Project submissions can can be made, uh, and so we are working on that. So that will come uh, with time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question as, is asking whether if somebody develops a rheumatic disease as a result of getting COVID and then recovering, would this be possible to be included in the database? That is, uh, COVID has triggered the inflammatory arthritis. Would that be so, a case to include? So the, the database is not primarily designed for this. The database is designed for patients that already have a diagnosis of a rheumatic condition and uh, develop COVID or suspected COVID. However, having, having said this, if people are really keen on including that, that case, there is one possibility which which is uh, 
to mark this as a complication of, of the infection. And then on the question about the diagnosis, they could choose other and say, that, and, and state that the patient did not have a rheumatic disease at, at baseline. And then in the part about complications, they could state that the, the rheumatic condition uh, was a complication of the disease. However, you know, so there is this possibility, but I have to say that the, the database is not primarily designed to capture uh, the development of a rheumatic disease as a, as a consequence of the, the viral infection. Okay. Um, so we don't have uh, many more questions here. I don't know whether you want to to ask yourself some other question. If not, yes, I, I really want to think, thank all of you who have worked uh, to make this possible and for especially all the people who are reporting their cases to the database for the will of uh, everybody. It's not just for uh, for the theoretical things, but uh, we want to get uh, some answers. And uh, uh, you should know that uh, the next uh, analysis that are being prepared are looking at very interesting things about different uh, drugs and different uh, diseases, how they are behaving. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, any questions, please uh, write on the email. Okay, for the for the COVID Eula where you got the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.